I'm Marissa Anita. A warm welcome to all of you here today. We're here today to listen to and engage with two ministers of education to share ideas on how to transform education and research for a better society. And today is a special day where together we celebrate the long-standing ties in education and research between Indonesia and the Netherlands. And this year, Indonesia is integrating its domestic and global efforts to develop its human capital. The presidency of the G20 forms an excellent example of this agenda. And Indonesia is doing so with partners like the Kingdom of the Netherlands. To bolster the efforts, the Netherlands has set up its first ever knowledge mission to Indonesia. Twelve heads of the most important knowledge institutes in the Netherlands have flown to Indonesia to meet universities and knowledge institutes here. The mission is headed by a very special person, Minister Robert Degraaf for Education, Culture and Science, who we're going to meet, listen to and interact with today. So, the minister and his delegation are here to meet key figures at the top of Indonesia's science and education fields. And these meetings usually take place behind closed doors, of course, in the ministries itself. But today, we're making an exception. Knowledge has been shared for centuries, be it through books, like these books, for example, or discussions like the one we're about to witness so, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce two ministers of education, one a businessman and the other a scientist, but they share a similar goal, transforming science and education for a better society. Over the next 30 minutes, these two ministers will get to know each other and then pick each other's brains on the value of education and science, concrete policies, and how their two countries can cooperate to reach the goal. Let's see if their ideas overlap, complement, or, you know, to see what might work. After the discussion, I will return to the stage to put your questions to both ministers. And this is definitely a rare opportunity for you to interact with the ministers, so I would encourage you to ask away. You can ask them questions around the value of education and knowledge, educational policy, or international cooperation in these fields. And you will have approximately around 20 minutes. So probably 20 minutes, around four or five questions. Yes, and now, without further ado, Without further ado, I can hear, stand by. <laughs> Allow me to introduce the two ministers speaking this afternoon. The first one, Mr. Robert Degraaf, Minister of Education, Culture and Science of the Netherlands. He is a theoretical physicist, mathematician and string theorist, just like Einstein. He has served as the director and Leon Levi Professor at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. Hello, Minister. And a tenured professor at the University of Amsterdam, as well as the president of the Royal Netherlands Academy for Arts and Sciences. Good afternoon, Minister De Graaf. Please have a seat. Minister De Graaf, I would like uh, to invite you to uh, be seated over here, actually. Yes. And, of course, uh, the next speaker, Bapak Nadim Makarim, Minister of Education, Culture, Research and Technology of Indonesia. Before he became a minister, he was the CEO of Gojek, an Indonesian on-demand multi-service platform and digital payment technology group based in Jakarta. He is currently the youngest cabinet minister, graduated from Brown University studying international relations, and gained an MBA from Harvard University. Everyone, once again, please welcome Minister Degraaf and Minister Makarim. So, ministers, how was your meeting this morning? Oh, it was, uh, I had a fantastic session with the minister this morning and met all the delegates from Holland, mm -hmm. including the heads of the higher education. Thank you so much for making this your first trip outside of Holland as a, as a minister. We're, it's a great privilege. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you so much, you know, and it's, uh, it's such, uh, you know, sometimes it's wonderful to be a minister of education, but usually there's only one of you 
in the country. So it's so nice to uh, meet a direct colleague. Same here. And uh, <laughs> share our ideas, uh, our frustration, uh, our ambition. That's right. And I think it's, uh, you know, it's not by accident that our first uh, you know, international knowledge mission of this new Dutch government is to Indonesia, because I think it's just an expression of the, you know, the warm uh, bonds that are there. Uh, you know, there's a close friendship, and it's uh, being expressed uh, every day with the collaborating students and teachers and researchers. So uh, it's uh, quite appropriate, I think, uh, that, that we are here. And thank you so much for, for hosting us. Thank you, thank you. We, we, we had a churhat session before this, because <laughs> we're, both, we're both education ministers that have never been in government before. So there was a lot of war stories that we've been sharing. Before. It, it was our therapy session. <laughs> yeah, it felt like therapy. All I right. feel much better. I guess, ministers, the floor is yours. There oh, we thank go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I, I, I just wanted to ask you, you know, as a first question, you know, can you tell us more, minister, about your mission to Indonesia? What is this mission about? Well, I think the mission is uh, to strengthen and accelerate that's already here. You know, mm -hmm. we have this uh, incredible. Uh, long, rich tradition, uh, organic uh, connections between our universities, but uh, I think we can go to the next level. And uh, I think that's what, why we are here. Uh, you know, we brought uh, you know, uh, top of our educational institutions, research institutions uh, that are all eager um, to, you know, to, to build a relationship and make it honestly a, a, a kind of symmetric relationship because the, the wonderful thing is I, I'm hearing from our educators, from our researchers that, you know, they feel there's a lot to, to gain, mm -hmm. but also a lot to give. And I think, you know, usually uh, it's like with relations between people, often the best relations are the ones which are complementary. Of course. So you have to offer each other something that the other doesn't have. Yes. Uh, and I think this is exactly uh, the nature of this, this mission. So, uh, but, but Minister, you know, one of, we, we discussed before, one of the biggest differences between us is that I, I, I not only am new to government, I'm also new to education. Yes. But you are an experienced educator for over 30 years, scientist, academician, uh, and for those of you that don't know, um, he is, uh, Minister, uh, is, is, uh, is the first theoretical physicist that I've met person. <laughs> so if any of you know anything about physics, um, that's like the class <laughs> of, of physics. Um, and my question to you on this is that given that experience, what do you want to say to politicians and leaders about education? You must have something to say being in it for so long. What, what's one thing you'd like to say to them? Well. You know, often as a scientist, you uh, are very proud uh, to know what you don't understand. So I think, you know, one thing I noticed that, you know, if you talk to many politicians, they have very strong views on education. Uh, they know exactly what's wrong and what has to be said. And if you spend your life in education, you, you know it's, uh, it's a very fragile, uh, it's something that has, you have to do with, with care. Yep. And there, um, you know, and, and there are uh, incredible uh, forces uh, that you can, uh, can use, right? So because anybody who's in education do that because they have a passion. Uh, they, 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 they believe in, in progress, in, in making the world better, etc. So uh, in that sense, uh, you know, one lesson I have is that uh, just I said, you know, you, you, you and I are in this position that we are top down. Mm. We have to basically facilitate the right movement that comes bottom up. That's right. Uh, I feel that's, that's an important thing. And, uh, and again, you know, sometimes uh, what I, I also feel is that, like a, a, as a theoretical physicist, if I'm confronted with a new problem, we always have the moment where we clean the blackboard mm. and say, okay, let's just from scratch think about what exactly is the issue, et cetera. And I think you need that kind of moment also in, in education. Absolutely. And I, I feel, and I th actually... But that know, takes courage to do. That, that needs courage to do, mm -hmm. but it starts by acknowledging um, that you, there are certain things you're not quite certain about. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, another lesson I have is uh, you know, the scientific method, mm -hmm. which is you can try things out, you can analyze, you can improve. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the way you make progress. 
And uh, you know, th these are some of the lessons that. Uh, for me, it's literally the only way of making progress. Yeah, because you, as, you know, with your incredible experience in not only in business, but building this tremendous business. Um, it, I'm, you know, it's absolutely fascinating, first of all, that somebody with your uh, achievement chose to uh, make your life so uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you do this? But secondly, what are the lessons that, that you, uh, you know, took or were, were able even to implement because you're now th three years in so, so, and achieved already quite something. So I, I think, <clears throat> you know, this is one of the only few multiverses that I decided to become a minister, <laughs> I think. Um, so I, I don't know exactly. Uh, I remember the reason why I said yes is because I think I thought that if I turn this down, what is the probability that I would regret it later on? Yes. The chance to yes. affect an entire generation. Yes. And I could not, even if I failed, I realized that, I simulated that in my mind, even if I failed, just the, the act of not trying and not yes. attempting would forever haunt me. Yes. So it was a less positive <laughs> than most people. <laughs> it was essentially a negative one. Yes, it was, but it, it worked. It yes. worked. It was a good motivator. Yes. To, but uh, it, it's, been, it's been tough, but there's been incredible things that I brought um, from my previous experience that I think helped me a lot. One was what you mentioned before about the, for, for you it's the, the scientific model. Um, in technology, it is the iterative model, yes. right? It is the, the try, adapt, modify, iterate, try again. And um, I think because that has been my modus operandi of solving problems. Um, having the courage to do that and make mistakes on the national education uh, uh, scale was natural to me, yes. even if it invited criticism from people. It's like, at the end of the day, I need the data points. I yes. need to know what sticks, what works, et cetera. So that gave me the courage to know that I will at least find what doesn't work. Yes. And what doesn't work is just as important as what works. Um, and, and that's something I, I, I keep close to heart. The second thing is, um, I think bringing some young people into government works. <laughs> that's, mm -hmm. that, that definitely works. Yes. Um, but it, it doesn't work the way most young people, I came in with being, being a millennial, you come with a lot of prejudices about the older generation, yes. you come with a lot of prejudices about government. Yes. Uh, because you know we live, we live in a country where there's a lot of problems, so there's a natural sense. But one of the things that surprised me the most coming into government was the number of talented bureaucrats yes. in government that were not just talented, they were idealistic yes. with high integrity. Yeah. So the combination between those senior, senior bureaucrats and this millennial team that I brought in from the private sector, that combination is what made the whole ministry move. Honestly, me as a minister, I don't do any of the work. I make decisions, I problem solve, but the work is actually done by these bureaucrats and these millennials. And so that learning, that mixing the young, the old, the, the private and the public in a way that you share, the only thing they share is common values. Yes. It's the only thing they share. Their mission is the same. Everything from their style, their language, totally different, different. totally different, as, as, as you've realized I mean, in the last uh, six months. I think that's such a, such a wonderful experience because, you know, again, going back to science, you mm -hmm. know, uh, the, the amazing thing is that, uh, you know, you typically every year there's somebody, you know, might be 25 year old, that comes with an idea that is so good and so different, you know, and we all, you know, even the most senior scientists, you know, uh, they just bow and, you know, follow the lead because yes. there's always this this fresh take and I, I personally also feel one of the great thing of education particular higher education is that we have this great resource which are the young people and the students etc so you know there, there aren't, aren't many other fields where some sense the the I would say kind of the customers or something are also part of the solution right they, yeah. they can actually bring this and uh, so I, I I think that's that, that's, you know, it's a great quality. Uh, and actually comes to, to another question I want to ask you, which we talked about briefly, is that 
there seems to be a paradox in education, right? Because education is all about the future, it's about change, it's mm -hmm. about learning. Mm -hmm. uh, yet, if you look at all the fields in society, perhaps education isn't the most innovative, right? Uh, and I put an it very that's politely. That's an understatement. Uh, <laughs> so why is this? Because you might think that you know, this is the one branch of society that's all about innovation, about learning. It's almost by definition. Forget the fact that the school system has been largely structured the same way for a couple of hundred years yes. or so, or maybe Some 100, 150 in, years. Yes. Um, is kind of weird. Can you think of any other system in the world? That's so set in its... Uh, that, that, that has practically had a hazard. I mean, you look at the hospitals 100 yes. years ago, and you look at the hospitals now, and they're completely different. Yeah, exactly. Um, why, why wouldn't schools be? Uh, so this is the question, right? And, and I think the, the answer of why um, is, lies in there, there is some level of intrinsic inertia or conservatism in the education system, both in higher education and in lower education. And that also comes with the fact that a lot of the people in the system have been there for such a long time. They've been there for such a long time, whereas in other fields, you're in and out, going into places. So I think, I feel that my job is to shock the system out of lethargy, to wake the system up and realize, wait a minute, if we don't change, then it, nothing's gonna happen, like it's not going to be an explosion or anything, yeah. or it's no, no, not a disaster or catastrophe the educational system will just become fade into irrelevance. Mm -hmm. It will just be something that maybe some people participate in, maybe not. University will just be like a cute option maybe, right? That, that, but most people, the market is efficient. Yes. The market will always find the most relevant thing to improve themselves. And if the universities and the schools don't provide that, people will search elsewhere. Yeah. And I don't want to see that because it's, yeah. in, it's incredible the amount of talent we have in our universities and our schools. We just have to shift to, to a model whereby relevance to the end user, which is the student, yeah. relevance in their future is the, the bottom line. At the end of the day, I always tell professors this all the time, is, please ask yourself the question, is what I am doing or teaching or saying today, right now, going to be relevant for my students' future, yeah. right? And it doesn't have to be their monetary future. It can be their whole life future, their emotional welfare, their future with their family. It can be about survival skills, emotional mastery, yeah. anything at all, but is it relevant and useful for my students? And this is a question that I'd like more educators to keep asking themselves, yeah. right? because that encourages a much more innovative mindset. I, I'm curious, you know, I read something uh, about you, Minister, uh, that when you were visiting Leiden University, you mentioned uh, something about technology that was a little bit critical yes. of technology. And you mentioned, and I quote, uh, the technology threatens to become a black box that hardly anyone can open. What did you mean by this? Well, I mean, I. Okay, so one thing, if I see technology or just, you know, technological progress in society, I think you see two things. So on the one hand, you know, by definition, you know, it becomes more complicated, right? None of us knows exactly what's happening inside our iPhone, you know. No. Uh, and so, but on the other hand, technology is much more integrated in our lives. So it's the one thing that moves away from us and moves closer at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, the, so uh, what I see as a possible threat is that technology will be all-encompassing. You know, it will actually be uh, governing us, mm -hmm. but we will not understand it, or at least the people at large will not understand that. So, I, I feel there's a, you know, there's really a, a challenge here. How do we uh, bridge that gap to where all the technological developments are, and you know, can we can we still be in control? Can we understand? Um, and um, and actually, and I know you know you you you're a great fan. You know, you, you know I don't I don't have to explain you the power of, uh, the power that technology has. But of course, you know, as with any technology, particularly the digital world, has you know uh, the lights and shadows. 
Yep. Right? And uh, it's extremely powerful. It can be a tremendous force for good. Uh, you know, I couldn't think of uh, my previous life as a scientist without you know, accessing all the information in the world, you know, just from my computer, etc. On the other hand, we see disinformation. We see um, you know, uh, alternative realities being built. Um, so there, uh, there's always this, this issue whether we feel we are in control. And I must say, you know, my previous job uh, in Princeton, uh, the most famous person that had that job was Robert Oppenheimer. So we lived in the house mm. of Oppenheimer. And I actually was every day working in his office. And, you know, the nuclear physics is another example, you know, where you can see the, the sh lights and shadows, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I sometimes worry about this. I worry both about the use of technology, the adverse use, and the way are we still able, as a society, to understand what's going on and, you know, keep our connection and be in control. Uh, honestly, it terrifies me. Um, in many, many ways. And coming from a, someone from a technology background, I, I think that should mean something. Yes. Um, I mean, with, with, with my previous experience in technology, I saw firsthand how powerful, I mean, at that point, Minister, one of the technology company that I built had provided the most number of jobs out of any other private sector institution, period, yes. at that time. And so I've seen the light yes. of that. I've also seen how disruptive it is to existing yes. networks yes. and how that affects change in such a, uh, a big way. And of course, you know, there are some bad sides of it. Anyone that's been addicted to a food delivery apps <laughs> <laughs> can attest to this. But social media yes. and this digital information platforms are a new level of dark yes. in my mind. And there's a reason why and, uh, children of Silicon Valley people are completely, uh, they completely forbid their children to play with gadgets. Yes. Uh, there's a reason why I forbid my children to play with gadgets, you know, apart from the occasional take a photo of data. Yes. Um, but it... But will you, as a minister of education, uh, forbid all the students to... Uh, I cannot. You cannot. Would cannot. you wish you could? My whole, the whole platform is called emancipated learning. Yes. And not letting them go online would kind of defeat that mission. No, um, I was joking. But, but <laughs> I tur because I thought about it. Yes. <laughs> I, definitely, I definitely thought about it. Um, but I don't think the youth understand it yes. and often the older generation. So even though I'm still a millennial, even I am left behind from the Gen Zers, and the Gen Zers are already left behind by their little brothers and sisters. Yes. And it's going to be constant evolution of not being in touch with the next generation because they're already on the next platform. Who knows what's next after TikTok, right? It used to be, you know, now like I, I just recently spoke to a. 17, an 18 year old that told me the reason that she does not like YouTube and instead watches TikTok is that five to six minute videos are too long. Yes. Yes. Oh, come on. Don't even like <laughs> As if that hasn't happened to you, okay? So <laughs> give me a break. Um, yes. So it used to be what long was for me, and yes. I know I grew up on YouTube, um, for me, long was an hour and a half, two hour movie, and you know, but now long is five, six minutes. So I would urge younger people to very, uh, always have that healthy dose of skepticism yes. in terms of whether their um, social media activity is causing them true joy or just dopamine yeah. that then makes them kind of depressed when they don't have it. So. Have you ever tried to sit in a bus or a plane without your phone for a while and just sit still? I can imagine for you it's terrible. Yes. It's yeah. agony, right? Not having your phone. Well, that's the, the indicator that you're kind of addicted to something. And so that's, yeah. that's the worry that I have. But, but, yeah. but I think there's another issue that I worry about, which is, I know, and you could see it uh, you know, strongly around the world with the pandemic, mm. right? Uh, so I, you know, as a scientist, was so happy 
that you know science could find a way out. Um, but then I was really surprised that you know there was this kind of anti-science movement in yes. almost any country. Uh, and so the thing I worry about is what is the absorptive power? Uh, you know, we have to prepare the next generation to absorb new information, new tools. Um, and uh, I'm not sure whether a 30 second uh, TikTok movie will do the job here. So it might. It might. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, that's the that's one thing I do worry about. You know, yes. because if if uh, we prov if we provide uh, new information uh, and it doesn't it doesn't stick, uh, and what can we do to to prepare, let's say, the next generation to uh, to absorb all of this? Well, you know, we're we're democratic countries. Yes. Can't exactly ban these social media platforms. Yes. And I think there's a lot of positive yes. things that they bring as well. But if you ask me, there's only, to use the vaccination yes. analogy, there's really only one vaccine. So you can, you can give it, so like if you have- A if vaccine you have, against the disinformation. Against disinformation. And the only sustainable vaccine for disinformation is critical thinking. Yes. It's critical thinking. And, um, and critical thinking in this aspect, you, we don't have to go into too complicated terms about what critical thinking is. Just simplify it. It's, it's that healthy dose of skepticism yes. combined with curiosity, yeah. right? It's, the two, it's a two-step process. Getting information, recognizing that, first of all, wait a minute, is it true? Could it be not true? Yes. That reflex, and then having the curiosity yeah. to actually go look it up and go find out more about it, talk to people about it, Google it, yes. uh, search another source. Just that instinct alone is, I think, the long-term vaccination. That's the immunity yeah. to this. I have not yet seen anything else work yeah. uh, because it's so compelling. The disinformation content is so compelling. Yes. It's always controversial, it's always negative, and anything negative goes trending way higher yeah. than anything positive, right? Yeah. That's why the world looks like it's always collapsing online, right? Because bad news always yes. goes further. So I, I think that really at its core, I don't know, the scientific method, you call it the scientific method, you can call it critical thinking, yeah. structured, or a healthy yeah. dose of skepticism, which every scientist must have, especially a physicist. Yeah. Um, I think really is the long-term vaccine yeah. for this problem. Do you have? Do you no, think I think I else? agree, and but also it, it it makes our job even more important, right? But mm. because the thing is, you know, if any if any place where this this vaccine should be uh, uh, you know uh, given, it's in in, in school, right? Mm. So yes, uh, exactly. you know, here is actually where you learn. And the interesting thing is that you the things that you learn then it's not so much about the actual content, mm. as is to understand you know, what's true or not true, or you know, try things out for yourself, uh, search for yourself. These are like general skills. Yes. Uh, the same way, I think, when you build up immunity. You, know, you might build immunity by uh, you know, dust or whatever, you know, but you train your, the system and you remember. And I think you know, it's probably something that we um, sort of question is if we in school we only focus on learning the fact that at some point you know will be probably no, no longer very much relevant yes and we should probably you know l learn more about the process which i think i mean often i feel the process is something what you just said you know being curious imagining things but also be, being critical that actually is something that endures yeah. so i often say you know the scientific method you know that they used in the 17th century, the method is still relevant. You know, the actual questions they studied at that time, you know, we, they all, they're way be be behind us, and yes. we are, we're, of course, dealing with completely different questions, but still with the same kind of methodology. I mean, that is the very reason why we discontinued our national exam system, which is all about the facts. Yes. It's all about memorizing the facts and how much, how many facts can a student cram in one session of exam. That's why we got rid of it and instead focused on core aptitude, yes. logical reasoning. Wow. That's really a big step. Right? Numeracy and literacy. Yes. Asking them about situations and do they understand what's happening in this situation. Yes. Asking them to problem solve something in a real contextual 
question. It's those skills that actually matter. It's, it's, I think that's what actually an educational system should be focusing is that, towards. Is that one of the policies I mean, yes. that you're most proud of? Or, or what, you know, it's, what, it's, what would it's, be your top three? I would say it's the most popular one. <laughs> but they, they didn't experience it, so they kind of regret it, I think, yes. because they were already in university at the time. Yes. But their brothers and sisters, for sure, are super happy. Uh, that it's not there. I must say, I love it. I mean, often I say that you know, you you can take a, you can get a perfect score on a test without knowing anything about the subject. I yes, think, you, know, you you can that's do the so. Key. That's a yeah. good test for yeah. aptitude. Yes, right, and yes. that's what we want. We want people who can think on their feet because yeah. honestly, in the future, no job. I have yet to see a job whereby the primary requirement is how much you can memorize, unless you're a professional number. Um, champion, you yeah. know those numbers. You're a professional memorizer. Yeah, okay, that job you These need to human memorize. Calculators. Yeah. Uh, there's a huge market out there. For, <laughs> it's like, oh no, there isn't. <laughs> but 99.9 percent yes. of jobs, from yeah. the highest prestigious of the knowledge economy yeah. to the lowest, most common mass market job that's minimum wage, it doesn't matter. The ability for you to think on your feet the ability for you to solve your problems, whether at work or life or finances, all of these things come down to this core problem-solving skill, yes. how to understand that, and also be able to um, combine that with ability to get help and work together with other humans. So you think, if you said that, you know, we're basically still stuck in the 19th century, is this, is this one of the reasons why we often still feel stuck in the 19th century, at least with our systems? Because at that time, there was no Wikipedia. No, in some sense, it was much more important to memorize. I think so. I think it's, it's, technology has made it more obvious. Yes. But I think we've been outdated for a while, mm -hmm. uh, uh, for, for decades, I would argue. And, and the rate of change of the world is increasing at yes. a rate, like you said, we don't really understand. Um, by the end of my term and, and as, as the founder of my technology company, I had no idea what was going on in that application. Mm -hmm. Like I had, I had really no idea because I, I don't code, yes. right? So the distance that you mentioned. Yeah. And that's happening on a societal scale. Yes. I feel everyone is getting more and more detached from how things are actually working. made, how yeah. things are working. And, and therefore, I think what's funny and ironic is that every time we discuss in seminars or webinars, Everyone is talking about having creative, innovative kids. But I always ask the follow-up question, how do you expect to have creative, innovative kids if the schools and the teachers and the universities and the professors are not creative and innovative? Yes. How does that logic work? Yeah. So instead of trying to make the kids innovative and creative, the strategy that we've decided to implement is let's see what happens when we make the institutions of education as dynamic, creative, and innovative as possible. How do we make a school not be afraid of failure by trying new things? How do we make a prodi or a major program in a university um, break themselves apart to reconstruct something more multidisciplinary? Yeah. How do we do that? What kind of incentives, carrots and sticks can we do to, to make that happen? And so therein lies the theory of change. When the adults in the room change, then the kids will change too. Yes. And that's basically what, what, what our whole campaign has been all about. The adults in the room, changing them. Yeah, something along those lines. That's very yes. inspiring. Absolutely. <laughs> and when we look at the Dutch system, or, uh, and it seems like we're so far apart. Every time uh, many of the ministers of education of the, the emerging economies uh, you know, it, we're very jealous. Uh, smaller populations, higher mm -hmm. GDP per capita, etc. Yes. But I'm sure the challenges are no joke. No. And they are massive. And I'd love to hear more about, because I think everyone kind of already knows the challenges of, of developing economies yes. that come intrinsically with having a, a lower GDP per capita. But what is it in the, in the, in the higher GDP per capita yes. world what are the challenges that you face? Well, I would say the grandest one is that, uh, I would say is inequality, because mm. I think anything that happens, whether it's a pandemic, 
whether it's a financial crisis, uh, whether it's climate change, somehow it doesn't matter. Uh, the, the inequalities seem to become bigger. Hmm. And so that's a real struggle, uh, I think, for any country, but particularly also for the Netherlands. So, uh, you know, there's still a, a large proportion uh, of the country that's dropping out that, um, you know, um, in some sense is, is missing opportunities. And I think, you know, that, that's definitely, I think, one of the, of the greater challenges. And, uh, to, uh, and part of that is actually to do, you know, I mean, in some sense, education seems to be very much like a, a, a one-dimensional thing. You, know, you just move higher, right, to be more advanced, etc. Another thing I, I feel we are struggling with is that, to, to be completely honest, you know, not every student can have an education at a top research university. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this hierarchical view of education is not, I think, a, a fair depiction of the qualities of people. So one thing I try to do is to, to present a different view, where I say there's more a, a broad range of educational opportunities. More, some are much more vocational. They're just as valuable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there is a, students are, are not one-dimensional objects that can be rated on a one-dimensional scale. And so you know, some are more creative, some are more entrepreneurial, some like more to work in teams. So I think actually uh, a big challenge is to uh, provide these educational opportunities for all of them with, the, with a broad range of, um, of skills. And I think that's something that, you know, in, in some sense a more developed educational system, um, it's, it, it's, very, it's very necessary because you, know, you can't, you know, it's perhaps strange to say, but you know, there's this upward lift, the thinking, that you know, everybody can do better and more, uh, at some point it also creates a system where peop many people feel they lose out. Yeah. Um, so to have a more equitable educational system, uh, you know, we need more equity in the world, but I think also within our countries. And I think that's, that's uh, to be honest, uh, a challenge. And actually addressing these inequalities is, I think, key to uh, uh, addressing social issues, uh, making the country more cohesive, uh, and you know, also addressing issues, for instance, that we're also struggling with, you know, m matching the educational system on the labor market. Because you know, we are confronted with a lot of uh, shortages in lots of key uh, issues. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, find, I mean, redirecting students to these areas, which are you know, growth areas for the future, which actually they can develop their talents, where they feel at home. Uh, I think that these are some of the challenges that you know we're struggling with. I, I absolutely love that because you know inequity has been a very core theme in our transformation agenda, and and honestly, the COVID situation has made it a lot more uh, sharp and distinct, yes. and made it more obvious. And so I, I think that. You know, one of the things I always like to say is that uniformity does not mean equality. Yes. And this is something that people mistake a lot. Uh, and moving, and government's job is to level the playing field. Yes. That's one of the core reasons why we exist. Well, I think honestly that's the point. So yes. if you say what's the one thing that can counter this very natural movement, because it's something the law of gravity. You know, yes. It's just, it's an you know, unstoppable force, unless I think you know, governments intervene. Absolutely. And, and I think the one place where um, this equity can be restored or is, uh, is in education. Yeah. It's a great equalizer. Yes, thank is. you so yeah. much, Minister. Yeah. I think we've run out of time for uh, our <laughs> session, but thank you so much. Wow, perfect timing. Wow, perfect timing, Ministers. What an insightful discussion. I was just listening. I was just completely wrapped listening, and I'm sure all of the students are too or were too. And uh, I'm also sure that they have questions to ask you, uh, Ministers. Uh, who would like to uh, start first? You can raise your hand and then uh, say your name, from which university you are, and uh, which major. Go on. It's okay. Ah, there you go. Yes, that gentleman over there. Yes, yes. All right. Uh, selamat siang, Pak. And good afternoon, sir. And hello, everyone. 
My name is Mohan Faris Nirwan from IPB University, and I'm currently an undergraduate management student. Uh, yeah. I was so flabbergasted with the things that we just discussed before because it was so insightful and it was such a privilege to be here around the others. Um, delegates here to seeing you guys have a discussion about the education that we have now in, in, in both of the countries, Indonesia and Netherlands. But here's the thing, uh, when we discuss about this topic, like that transforming education and research for a better society, right? So we have the highlights here that we want that education to have um, an impact towards uh, the society. Yeah. And as you guys discussed before, on a note, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you say that a school system that we have now, a long time ago, is not like what we have right now at this very moment, right? And means that education needs to be progressive. Education needs to shift accordingly with the reality that we face now in the, in the current moment and this very moment, right? And you guys talk about uh, innovation, talk about the breakthrough, scientific aspects, and so on. But here's the thing that we also know that education has an impact towards the social life of the social life, of course. So what I'm going to talk about in here is that regarding the topic, especially what we have in Indonesia right now is that, first of all, uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, especially want to discuss or seeing you guys' point of view about this matter. First of all, that we have right now in Indonesia is that uh, we cannot deny the fact that criminality regarding sexual violence exists in society, right? And second, hopefully that if we saw through the internet regarding this topic, netizen would say that uh, this is one of the, imp the importance of sexual education that need to be tough in, in, in formal institutions, especially school or university. But of course, uh, within an appropriate, an appropriate rate of our age, yeah. yeah, young age and so on. And the third is that there's a lot of misconception that's circulating around the society regarding this topic, especially when people say that sexual education means a free sex, which in fact that is not, because if we really uh, learn about the sexual education, it's about consent, it's about privacy, it's about protecting ourselves from the sexual violence and so on. So, and yeah, due to that, there's a lot of things that happen like the unprepared early marriage and so on that, as we can see right now in Indonesia, right? And of course, I know that uh, Mr. Uh, Minister already have an eye on this case, especially when he already brought up that one of the dari tiga dosa besar pendidikan itu salah satunya adalah sexual violence. It means that it's already been on the eye of the Minister of Education, right? And in here, I'm actually curious about um, you guys' point of view regarding this topic, especially when we know that in Indonesia, sexual education is very taboo, especially on certain areas. And but we do really think that it is one of the things that is very important that been taught in the society right now. So yeah, I want to see from both of you guys' point of view because we already know about the innovation that we that we already developed in the educational system right now, especially in Indonesia that have been so progressive right now and there's a lot of breakthrough from the ministers. But yeah, uh, maybe we can uh, also talk about this kind of matter. And yeah, that's for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Ministers? Okay, uh, I'll start with that. Um, so, uh, I think you all know how big of an issue and how big of a priority this is for our ministry. Um, we took the first hits out of any other government institution when we launched the Permendikbud number 30, as you know, right, on sexual violence in universities. Uh, we did it for a few reasons. First, it was a massive problem obviously. The second, we did it uh, because we realized that if we're not going to carry the torch, who else is going to, right? Uh, and then it became a national agenda. We got accused of all kinds of silly things. Uh, so, so just to let you know, we were yes. accused of legalizing free sex because we had the word consent on it. This is how how um, ridiculous it is trying to protect I know you took a brave we, stand, so <laughs> uh, thank you for doing that. <laughs> thank yes. you. Uh, um, but it, it was, it, uh, the reason why this is important for the Ministry of Education is not just from the ethical and moral perspective. The science is very clear that there is no, how do you connect it back to learning, that no learning can exist in an environment that does not foster psychological safety. 
Psychological safety is the prerequisite to learning. Without that, there is no learning. And so it's even more of an imperative that this becomes a key uh, uh, priority. And for the first time in Indonesian history, we now have the Assessment Nasional, which actually assesses risk of sexual violence from SD, SMP, SMA, lower education, all the way up to uh, a high school. Um, so the first time we have real-time data per school across all the regions about this risk. So it's something that we will continue to fight for and calling it the three sins. So we call it the three sins of, of education system is um, uh, intolerance, uh, bullying, and sexual violence. Uh, so that's, that's my stance. I don't think I need to speak more about it. You know where I stand on it. Well, I thank you so much for taking yeah. that, that point of view. And I must say, also in the Netherlands, you know, if you see what are the issues that, for instance, you know, students in higher education are most worried about, mm. is exactly this kind of safety. And I think you know, whenever you have a situation, essentially a situation where a senior person controls your future, yeah. you're very vulnerable. Uh, so actually, that vulnerability is exactly why we love education, right? Because you can shape, you can change people for the better, you can learn things that carry on for your whole life. But it can also be a dangerous situation. And I'm shocked also in the Netherlands how, uh, how many bad experiences are there. And in some sense that we are forgetting these, I would almost call them soft issues, but they're not soft because they are hard, because they make you know, education impossible. Mm -hmm. But the culture, the atmosphere that we create in our education institution is, I think, just as important as our curricula, Absolutely. our tests. You know, uh, the things that we usually think of. And, um, and so this is, uh, you know, and I think particular for higher education because it's actually the time when you're, as a person, you know, you're still partially fluid. Exactly. Finding it's where your, your ideas are being set uh, and where you really can shape. And I think, you know, the uh, you, 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 question was quite appropriate, you know, if we think about uh, progress. It's not only technological progress, it's also social progress. And uh, in fact, again, uh, you know, education is great, when used correctly, it's a great engine of social progress. And part of it is also, I think, a recognition of these, um, these I would say, almost like cultural elements that I think also, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a renovation that was long overdue. Yep. I think in many places around the world. It's not something that's common to our, our, both our countries. It's something that's quite, I would say, generic to the field of education. I, I, just to add to your point, I completely agree with that statement that higher education should be held at a higher ethical and moral standard than the rest of society because it is your, it is your takeoff place. Yes for the whole generation. It is where you take off. It is where you start to identify who am I? Yes. What do I stand for? Uh, so. Um, and uh, by the way, and, and that's also true for, you know, having uh, critical views, you know, I, I think actually uh, within a university, you should be confronted sometimes with views that are not your, your own. Absolutely. Because if you, again, thinking of shaping and, you know, fostering your immune system, I think that's where it's being built, yes. uh, by this kind of confrontation. And the, the general public uh, discussion is something very different from the academic setting. Because in the academic setting, there are teachers. You, know, you, can, you can discuss about things in a controlled way, yeah. and that's the way I think you learn. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that question, and also the answers. <laughs> Next question. Yes, Miss. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, my name is Diva. Um, I'm from UIN, Jakarta. Uh, this year I will be graduating uh, and studying international relations. But right now I'm already working full time in a sustainability consulting. And yes, I'm a sustainability enthusiast. Uh, and here I want to ask a um, few questions or uh, questions. Uh, from His Excellency, Minister of uh, Education from Netherlands and our minister. Um, regarding, uh, you know, Netherlands is the center of uh, sustainability. And I think when it comes to sustainability, 
that should be like uh, uh, our general point of view in our young generations. Uh, there is, a, I know there is a education for sustainable development that right now uh, we have as part of the global agenda. But um, I want to see if there is opportunity between Indonesia and uh, Netherlands when it comes to education for sustainable development. Uh, you know, many countries, I think, uh, already implement a climate change education, uh, even for younger age. Yes. So I think it's very important uh, for us here in Indonesia to learn and, you know, uh, socializing those kind of global agenda of sustainability uh, from a very younger age. Thank you. Thank you, Diva. Ministers? Well, I think it's a wonderful point. Uh, if you say, well, uh, what are the few things you can achieve in education? You know, one of the great challenges, of course, you know, to uh, make our planet uh, keep it livable, uh, otherwise we don't need education anymore. Uh, so it, it's, uh, and again, it's, it's something you can address at a very young age, because it is both becoming you know, aware uh, of uh, what the challenges are, but also what the opportunities and what the solutions are. And, uh, and, you know, it's a wonderful topic because you can ask, you know, why would you discuss education? Uh, but you know, there are certain topics which are truly, you know, global problems. And, you know, we can only solve if the, if the whole world, uh, you know, addresses these issues. And, and so, uh, just as we know, we, we both teach our children, you know, arithmetic calculation because that's universal, two plus two. But actually this is also something, I think, you know, as you were saying, which is we can learn from each other. I think actually every country is still struggling how to embed you know, sustainable development as a real uh, you know, meaningful ingredient in the curricula. Um, and uh, I definitely I wouldn't say that the Netherlands resolved that, that puzzle. But I see more and more educational institutions embracing it. And, and, and not so much, uh, you know, developing courses on it, but making it something that is basically pervasive in the way you, uh, you build uh, educational institutions. And again, it comes back to the special role education institutions, in particular higher education, because it's a laboratory, right? It's a laboratory about how the world could be. You know, as you said, we should they should be held to a higher standard in some yes. sense. Because if, if you're not able to do it within the context of a university, how can you expect the rest of society to follow? So uh, I'm fully with you that you know, we should have set our standards very high. And it's a terrific topic, actually, to, uh, to continue the conversation. So yeah, thank you for that suggestion. Yeah. I, for us, you know, in Curriculum Merdeka, uh, it is our new curriculum. Uh, we're trying our best how to integrate it into the science uh, subject. Uh, as much as possible. Second, we've been in discussions multiple times, very, very challenging project of how to make universities just more environmentally, more sustainable. Yes. But it's not as easy as you would have thought. No. It's not, but it, you know, uh, but we're, that's something we are now exploring, how to do that. Um, the, the point of this all, at the end of the day, the younger generation are gonna bear the brunt of their Yes. older generations sins of the environment. It's going to be you and your children that is going to go through the darkest parts of, of climate change. And so it's, it's, it's not just a good thing, it's imperative. Yes. It's survival, all right? It's survival. And so um, it's something you, uh, I, I think educational systems need to uh, think as a must have uh, as, as part of their curricula. So one question I have, to you, and I think I'm also struggling with that, is that, uh, as we said earlier, students themselves can be a great force of change. Yes. Right? Because, you know, you basically can skip a generation if you uh, put them in charge. Mm -hmm. So uh, what are your views of how we can kind of channel that energy and, uh, you know, make them more in control or help steer the institutions that are shaping them? It's, it's very simple. Give them more power. Uh -huh. Just give students more power. Give them more choice in what they get to study in university. Allow them to study outside of university. Yes. Allow them to study for, from people that are not professors, but are practitioners. Mm -hmm. And just give them platforms to give them some level of autonomy, I think, in, in, in deciding what the university should do. I mean, yes. 
all universities try to talk about students kind of having some say, yeah, sure, you guys have like a student body. It doesn't really give you any power, not really, you know, uh, it, but I think that there's a lot more that can be said to giving um, agency yeah. to students to determine where often students very often have better answers yes. <laughs> in terms of what's best for them yeah. than the adults or the older people. Um, so I think asking students is, should be embedded in the process of university management. I think so. Expected a big round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> applause, why not? <laughs> we, only ha we only have time for one more question. So, oh, oh, there, yes, yes, please. Uh, good afternoon, ministers and everyone. My name is Arvin Rafi Muhammad. I'm from Bandung Institute of Technology, majoring in Geodesy and Geomatics Engineering. It is my honor to have a chance asking questions with both of you ministers. And my question is, uh, based on what we have discussed in this session, we already know that memorizing skills is not relevant. The relevant thing are problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, etc. Sometimes I think that those skills are exist since hundreds of thousands years ago. For example, like creating pyramid, medicine, navigating with stars constellation, and many more. My question is, how the system of what we call old school, like memorizing skills, mm -hmm. are exist, and why just now we have a full from old system? Uh, why just now we are talking about soft skills, teamwork, uh, etc., and we pack them that it is uh, 4.0 industry skills. While I think that those skills uh, should be accessed from a long time, uh, not just only now. And please correct my statement if I am wrong. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. you. Want to take that one first? Well, on. let me answer this with a little bit of a personal anecdote. So I, uh, I studied theoretical physics, and at some point I uh, stopped doing it. I got bored, basically because I was just taking all the exams and you know at perfect scores. But I, I lost lost my drive and actually went to art school. Uh, studying painting and uh, for me this was a tremendous uh, eye-opener because there are no exams there's uh, nothing like the perfect uh, answer to a test uh, the only thing that mattered at the end of the week is how much did I explore how big was the stack of drawings or whatever not about the quality but just how adventurous uh, uh, I was and uh, Art education is entirely about the process. It's completely not about outcomes. Uh, and for me, this was incredibly liberating. And I remember one point, I said, oh, I love this. If only I could do physics in this way. And then I thought, well, I can do physics yeah. in that way. <laughs> so I went back to university. Uh, I, I must say, didn't take any classes anymore. And, <laughs> and jumped into research. And so often I say, that you know, I actually learned to be a researcher in art school. And actually, it's true. Uh, and I think, so as you said, you know, the moment you put a pencil on paper, you, you make something that never, nobody has ever made before. Right? So as you said, you, know, for, you can see cave paintings you know, or that are like 30,000 years old. So that's a skill that's with us. You know, creativity is a skill with us. Imagination, you know, curiosity, these are innate skills. But honestly, I think, you know, it's not so much that we do not train them. I think we are actively uh, untraining them. You know, there is this, I think, you know, if you see a six-year-old, you know, they feel completely free to make drawings, to explore, etc. And often you see a 16-year-old that has for completely forgotten these skills. So, uh, so I think actually that's for me an indication that you know, probably moving into the future, we have to be probably thinking a little bit more like artists and less uh, as engineers. Or in some sense, even if you're an engineer or if you're a scientist, you're still building things, you're designing things. And, uh, and, and so, so I think we need these skills. And I think it's, it's our job to uh, provide an environment where uh, actually uh, these, these skills can blossom and where the people who want to change the system in that way can, can blossom. Yeah. Okay. I completely agree. 
I think anyone that's ever posted anything online, especially everyone here, will fully realize that the world is moving into a world of creators, of producers. And you know, the digital aspect of that is just the easiest analogy to make you understand that. That right now, you know, your value is going to be defined much more so by your creativity. Yep. What can you create? What can you produce on your own? Not what you can produce in necessarily in a factory with a thousand people in a line assembly, because that job will probably be gone yes. in a few years, right? So that's why that happened, that system. That system was created essentially to produce highly specialized and very uh, submissive factory workers during the Industrial Revolution, okay? In a specific part of Europe that then <laughs> spread everywhere else because everyone else followed Europe's uh, industrialization kind of evolution. So that's why it happened. That's the explanation. The, the better question is why didn't it change, right? Well, that's, that's really a question that has, that has haunted me <laughs> my, whole, <laughs> my whole time here and has been the biggest reason why I think people like us have left far more comfortable uh, positions and things that we do know of to deep dive into a completely alien world uh, whereby we can have, I think, even a bigger impact despite the personal pain that it brings us to, <laughs> to, to deal with all the other stuff, the politics, the pain, the public profile, you know. Oh, uh, the story life oh, of the ministers. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, Yes. An uh, extra therapy yes. session. I, I think we need a group <laughs> churhat session. <laughs> it's been three years for me, so I need more of the churhat session. <laughs> so in, in about I, two years, he'll be calling me saying, let's have another session. <laughs> if I can add and, and one more thing to it, and I think that's something we have in common both. I think, you know, you had a tr tr tremendous experience, you know, in your own education, in the way you were able to set up your company and be tremendously successful. I felt extremely privileged to, you know, to work at these wonderful institutions. And so I think we both uh, had the opportunity to be creative, to feel free, Absolutely. to be um, not stopped in any possible way. But I think we both share the thought that this is something, a gift, that should be given to every person. Right. Absolutely. And I think that's why we do the job. Completely agree. Well, well, unfortunately, sorry. yes, we've run out of time for the Q&A session, but uh, ministers, before we wrap up today, do you have any last words, thoughts, advice that you would like to share with the students here? I think he summed it up pretty well. That's it? <laughs> That's it? Think. I think we'll close oh, you it at do? that. Yeah. Minister Makarim, okay, well, thank you so much, Minister Dekrav, and also Minister Makarim for the insightful discussions and also with each other and also with the students. Thank you so much also uh, to the yeah. students for all of the good questions. And that pretty much wraps up today's discussion on transforming education and research for a better society. I'm Marisa Anita signing off. We'll see you again next time. Another round of applause for the ministers. Yeah.